You might have had an anti-holiday stance before we got on this, but I'm sure you've got a much greater one now. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, I never had any teaching on all of this. You just have to kind of glean it from things that you hear and things that you gather from the Word and the Spirit yourself. But it really is helpful whenever you have something set forth presenting itself against the holidays so that you have a proper conception, not a misconception, and not just an anti-conception of the holidays, which is really a misconception because a lot of people are anti a lot of things and they don't know why they don't have any basis for it. Amen. But when you've got a good basis for it, then you'll hate the holidays about like I do. Amen. And then you'll have the practice that some people like myself have. We finally got our first Christmas card today. And we just package them up and mail them back and tell them it's demonism and we don't participate in it. <laughs> That's one way to take care of your holiday cards. That's just our policy. If we get any, people ought to know better. But occasionally you meet someone new and, or the bank or, you know, your friendly local <laughs> library or something sends you one. So they're always, I'm sure they're shocked. I never, you never get one the next year, that's for sure. <laughs> I mean, how many people have their holiday cards sent back to them telling them it's demon worship? Not very many. But it's a good way to spread the truth. People are going to impose demonism on me i'm going to impose christianity on them which is what it amounts to yeah i package it up today it'll go out in tomorrow's mail assuming the mailman comes by tomorrow and the world is still standing so i want to go into some more holidays we've pressed through the two greatest ones christmas and easter and the other ones are entitled the lesser holidays, but I don't mean lesser in the sense that they're not as damaging in the area of the occult in one's spiritual life to participate in them. I only mean lesser with regard to their scope. Christmas and Easter just celebrated all around the world by just about everybody, and everybody has fun. I mean lesser in the sense of the lack of as much anticipation that precedes these holidays when you compare that with that which precedes Christmas number one and Easter behind that. Easter is a little more of a religious holiday, I will grant that, than Christmas is. Nothing, nothing out there is like Christmas. Amen. Even the stores, even, even, you know, sociologists and people who stay up with trends in American society are concerned that people start preparing for Christmas at Christmas time. And I don't mean that Christmas. I mean, either the next one or two or three or four or five years down the road. You know, when you're living five years in advance, you've got problems right away. And you know it's true because even in the store windows, things start coming out a lot earlier than they used to. Trying to capitalize on the weakness of people, on the demon worship of people. They just like seeing all the tinsel and the glitter in the windows and fake snow and this type of stuff to get them all prepared for the holidays to come around. So it's only in that regard that will entitle the other holidays the lesser holidays. Some of them are even worse when it comes to the occult and demonism, like Halloween, which is what we'll get to tonight. Hallelujah. We're going to go through another one, I think, before we get there. I'm not doing them in any particular order because of some spiritual significance, so don't try to uh, interpret something from the way I've set them up. I'm just going to go over them in the order that I've got them down. But yeah, Halloween's a lot more dangerous in the area of the occult than some of these others are. But we've seen already, and you can't have been here and be honest and not have seen in Christmas and Easter that it is demon worship. Sunrise service, that's the worship of the sun. Tammuz, that's right in the Bible. Ishtar, she's right in the Bible. <laughs> And we're talking about lost Christians, heathen Christians, that participate in these things. Amen. The Christmas tree's right in the Bible. That's right. yeah. All of these things, they're right in the Word of God. And heathen churchgoers are the ones who build up the economy the most and make store owners the happiest whenever these times come around. Well, let's start with Valentine's Day. Because I guess that's going to be the next big one. Comes in late winter, early spring, depending on where you live or how you look at it or whether there's snow on the ground or not. It'll be the next big one that comes along after Christmas. We kind of just tie 
<clears throat> New Year's in with Christmas because they always go together in the slogan, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Well, Valentine's Day, there are at least two legendary characters in Catholicism that go by the name Valentine. So right away, if you didn't know that, now you know something. Where the word or the term Valentine originate, <clears throat> well, it came from a legendary one of these two, which one no one really knows, probably the latter. That's at least a better guess than the former, as I'll explain them here in a moment. But here's where the word originates with one of these legendary characters in Catholicism. Who is St. Nicholas? A legendary character in Catholicism. We're not talking about Augustine or Aquinas or someone like that who really did live. We're talking about the figment of someone's imagination, which is based upon some demonic revelation that they got. Now, we around here, we should know our Old Testament well enough to see a lot of this right in the Old Testament, Israel worshiping demons under every form and guise. It didn't have to appear to them as a shaggy creature and therefore be this goat or this demon or this satyr or whatever. They worshiped demons under all different forms and all different types and symbols. Remember, we've already looked over there in Samuel and Kings and Judges where they're worshiping upon every high hill and under every green tree. What are they doing that for? That's where the demons live. They're trying to get close to the abode of the demons and you're involving yourself in demon worship. It's going to be true with most of the holidays. We're going to get past that by the end of tonight to look at some other things about certain holidays. But if they are not an actual worship of demons, then the concept behind the holiday, as we'll see, is certainly inspired by Satan because it's not according to the word of God. Right. One of these characters was a bishop in Italy who was beheaded, martyred for the faith around 270 A.D. And the other individual was a priestly physician. These are both supposed to be early Catholic figures. Remember that they're legendary. They did not exist. A priestly physician who had the magical power to cure epilepsy. What we call today epilepsy, what they thought of back then as possession by demons. And we charismatics think the same thing today. It's just got a medical name tag to it, but we think the same thing. Anytime someone starts frothing at the mouth and swallowing their tongue and kicking on the floor, I'd call that more than a disease. It's a demon that's manifesting itself through somebody's body. So here this early Catholic legendary priestly physician had not supernatural powers. We're not talking about 1 Corinthians 12 gifts of healing or anything. We're talking about magical powers and incantations that could cure this demon possession of people, which is what medical science refers to today as epilepsy. And he too, just like the Bishop of Italy, was martyred around 270. Both of them were martyred around 270 A.D. But is this the origin of the feast? Well, no, we have to go back to our surprise of all surprises, Roman festivals. It's this celebration of love, sex, erotic thoughts, lustful dreams, marriage, romance and so forth. Valentine's Day, in other words, this celebration of love of February the 14th came from, yes, of all things, another Roman festival, which was known as the Feast of Lupercalia. L-U-P-E-R-C-A-L-I-A. -A. The Feast of Lupercalia. This is uh, an encyclopedia dictionary fact. The Feast of Lupercalia, and it really was a twofold celebration, one of a Roman goddess and another of a Roman god. <coughs> the Roman goddess went by the name Februa Juno, two names, F-E-B-R-U-A, Februa Juno, obviously the origin for the name of our month, February. And this comes, remember, right in the middle of February. It was celebrated on February the 15th. More recent days has been moved back a day to February the 14th. Why, I don't know, and I don't know that anybody else does, but February the 14th is supposed to be the day of the celebration of love and marriage 
and happiness ever after. But it doesn't work that way when it's founded on wrong principle. So the goddess Februa Juno was the Roman goddess of women and of marriage, as well as birth, as well as, I think, just abstractly, the goddess of beginnings, which is what birth is all about, marriage is the beginning of a new relationship with another individual. But primarily, the goddess of women and marriage. If you've ever heard someone referred to as Juno-esque, have you ever heard someone use that word before? It means beautiful because we're talking about what would amount to the god of beauty, the goddess of beauty at this early time, since we're talking about women and birth and marriage. But if you hear a woman referred to as a Juno-esque woman, then she's a beautiful woman. Stately beauty is what it's supposed to mean. Don't call your, wo your wife Juno-esque or you're calling her after the name of a pagan goddess, so just call her beautiful <coughs> instead of Juno-esque. Well, that's one of the participants the heavenly sphere with this feast of Lupercalia. The other, we've got to find out where did we get this word Lupercalia from? Well, it comes from the name of the Roman god. Febra Juno is a Roman goddess. Lupercus, L-U-P-E-R-C-U-S, was the ancient Roman god of flocks and herds, you know, of goats and sheep and cattle and things like this. And indirectly, he was the god of fertility in people, the land, and their animals. I trust you can see we're kind of getting back into nature worship all over again. Fertility of people. And first and foremost, he's the god of flocks. You've got to have your flocks reproducing. You've got to build up the herd or at least keep the herd at its present numerical standard because after all wolves are going to get some others are going to die off by disease and plague and some are just going to wander out somewhere and be lost you've got to keep your animals going they give you your milk your butter your cheese your clothes that you wear and your meat they give you everything you've got to keep your flocks going so we have the roman god lupercus which was the god of the flocks and, you know, it's kind of around this time of the year that you start thinking of the fertility of your animals. You know, they're going to start bearing their young here very, very soon. They don't bear their young in the dead of winter. Some animals do, but not these. We're going to wait till the springtime, just the way things are set up. And not only the fertility of the animals, but the fertility of the land. February the 14th, or it was February the 15th. That's where it originated in ancient Rome. The Roman festival of Lupercus was celebrated on February the 15th. And whenever Valentine's was introduced in the picture, it was moved back to February the 14th. But anyway, when we're going back uh, this far in history, we don't have all of the modern conveniences that we have today. And so again, we're involving ourselves with the worship of nature because people are so dependent on nature. And around February the 15th, winter's more or less over and spring is more or less here. Really, winter is more over and spring is less here, to take one of the two words. And so it brings your mind to thoughts of sunshine, warmth, the growth of plants, the reproduction of your herds, your flocks, your livestock. So it's all in preparation. You've got to, in other words, have a festival and have sacrifice about this god and about this goddess you see she ties in because of marriage and women fertility that's what it's concerned about because you're going to have others produced by means of birth uh, through the women and so you tie these two together and we know that we're back to nature worship here's what was offered a goat and a dog had to be sacrificed it was a blood sacrifice and this was done both to Lupercus as well as to Februa Juno. <clears throat> Many times you'd have what they call a dual celebration of a holiday, where you'd have a plurality, in this case two, either gods or goddesses, or we could call mixed doubles together, so you can get two birds with one stone. And so after this sacrifice of the goat and the dog, you know what happened next? Well, we'll tell you if you don't know. The young boys had to select unmarried girls by lot out of a box. Their names were inscribed on little stones, pebbles, and put in some type of box. And the young boys had to, by lot, select 
these unmarried girls pebbles which represented them out of the box and they were bound to each other spiritually for the next year to be sweethearts this is exactly what happened back in ancient Rome <clears throat> so as time goes on you get figures like Cupid because uh, he is the god of erotic love Valentine's Day is not Valentine's Day without little pictures of little Cupid shooting his arrow at people. Whenever the arrow hits you, you're supposed to go into a lustful binge because he's the god of erotic love and Venus comes into the scene. Uh, by the way, Juno, I think, happened to be the wife of Jupiter, so she was one of the chief goddesses of ancient Rome. They all have their counterparts in other religions <clears throat> in other places and as we've said before they all go back to babylon sooner or later but again in this case we're confining ourselves in italy in europe because this is where christianity is stationed what happens well you ought to be able to put the rest of the story together the church is desperate for converts she's lost the holy spirit which is really the agency of making converts in the church and once you lose the power of salvation, the power of witnessing, the power of miracles and the supernatural, your church is going to either go nowhere or worse things of all, it's going to go downhill unless you can get more converts. And there are more heathens out there than you could ever hope for in your church. There's a right field to go and pluck as many heathens as you can get. And yet are you going to get them converted without the power of the Holy Spirit? No. But there's one easy way you can get them into your church, simply spiritualize their already existing holidays because they don't want to give things like that up. The heathens in the church today don't want to give things like that up. Whenever you start a new church, what do you have to do? You have to pattern it after other churches. Right. No one will come if you don't give them what they've had all their life before. I was reading today in a charismatic magazine that came out about one of this country's greatest churches. It's just amazing. There are 11 pastors in the church, 50 people on staff, singles ministry, divorcees ministries, grandparents ministries. Oh, you just wouldn't believe. Three services a day whenever they meet, 6,000 people who show up. And we're talking about someone with a master's degree in I don't remember what, and a doctor's degree in pastoral counseling and psychology, doctorate of philosophy. But who in the very article said himself, we're not very heavy on doctrine or teaching at all. We're heavy on personal relationships. You've got to meet the people where they are. But you heard that in the church before? You've got to meet the people where they are. Well, what are we talking about? You meet the heathens where they are. You offer them the holidays that they're already celebrating. You meet them where they are and get them into the church and you spiritualize the holiday hopefully taking away the demonic element so that God will be pleased because you've sanctified a certain day of the year. So yes, I'm sure we could all finish the story. The Catholics spiritualized the holiday and made it a feast for their martyr, Valentine, who never did exist, remember, by the way. No one knows exactly when this was done. As I said, it's a lesser holiday, not nearly as important as Christmas and Easter, and therefore not nearly as, as entrenched in historical extant records. Valentine cards were among the earliest greeting cards ever sent. Remember the Christmas cards didn't start on the scene until around the 1840s or 1850s over in England. But they were sent as early as the 16th century. The 1500s. The little boys who were still participating in this were required to send little cards, some type of little note, to their year-long sweetheart. We're talking about little boys and little girls. And you know today, as the holiday exists today, that is the basic element of the holidays. It is a romantic relationship between children on the grade school level. It worked its way up to include everyone. The grown-ups want to have fun with lust and sex, too. Don't let the children have all of the fun. So they got included sooner or later. But it started off, and it just worked its way through history with young boys and young unmarried girls. 
And you know today that's still the emphasis of Valentine's Day. It's one of the biggest holidays at school because there's where you find the young people. You have all of these little games that they play around this time of the year. What's wrong with it? Well, obviously, you ought to be able to see the sexuality, the romance attached and the love attached to this day of the year makes it so wrong above many of the other ones. Particularly when we're talking about four-year-old boys or 14-year-old boys or girls for that matter who simply aren't ready mentally and internally to deal with thoughts of romance, love, marriage, birth, raising a family, and so forth. These little ideas of sending little love notes and holding hands and little innocent kisses and the arm in the arm or the arm around the waist. You know, the children are encouraged to participate in this down on the grade school level. Well, it's no wonder that American society is reaping her problems that she's reaping today. It's love on first sight and marriage on second thought and divorce whenever everything's really been thought about. You see them, you love them, you marry them. The next thing, people don't wait today like they used to wait. You've got to do it now. And then whenever you're finally at home, then you're back at court the next morning. Mm -hmm. right. And you see, these things didn't even go on. We didn't have schools, remember. We didn't have schools. These things were done around the neighborhood. It wasn't all of this that's forced on the children that's been done only, and we're talking about the last 50 years now in this country, right. where it's become such a major thing in the public school system. It's one of the major things right. that's wrong in the public school system. These little boys and girls, dear friends, simply aren't ready to handle these internal pressures of commitment to one under other individual for a whole year, which to them is for the rest of their life. You know how long a day is to a child. A day to you is a different length. We're not talking about 24 hours. It's a different length to you today. The day is here and gone. But a child, the day is so long. There is so much to do there. What I'm saying is a year to them is like a lifetime to us. A year, they think a year, Mommy and Daddy, when am I ever going to be 16 so I can drive a car? When am I ever going to be 10 so I can get my own bicycle? They just think it's going to last forever. That nine-year-old stage of theirs is going to last forever. And here you are, 35, and you go to bed, and the next morning you're already 42. You, you wondered what happened all the time in between there. It doesn't go by like that for children. I mean, they, they exploit every day for every second that it has in it. Uh, children really live every day up because there's so much to be done in 24 hours in one day-long period. And so you get them attached for a year, I mean, this, we can go back. This is the origins of the going steady in school. People didn't used to go steady. You were too young to do things like that. But the school system encourages things like that with these external as well as internal pressures, external peer pressure from others around. You remember when you were back in school and you had to play these little games and kiss little girls and boys. You didn't even know what kissing was all about. You didn't know the dangers the dangers that followed things like innocently holding hands and kissing one another on the lips and on the cheek. And everyone just laughs and has a big time, and the next year you do it again, and pretty soon you're 14 and 15. This Valentine's Day is a pretty interesting day. Very neat. You look forward to this day. Pretty soon you're up 16 and 17. It's no longer holding hands. Valentine's Day is a good excuse for a whole lot of things. And who celebrates it? The church of our day. That's right. The church of our day has her little Valentine's parties right in the church for all the little children. And who do they worship? They worship Venus. They worship Cupid. They have their own little drawings of things like that. Well, they can say they do it innocently. Look over in 1 Corinthians 8. But they don't because anything, any of these little figures, whether it's Lupercus or Febra Juno or Venus or... Cupid, any of these little figures outside of God are demons, the scriptures say. 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 5. For though there be many that are called gods, there are many that are called gods, as well as goddesses. We've been mentioning many of their names just in our studies of the holidays. 
whether in heaven or in earth, and we've even got some under the earth. You know, there's some that live in heaven, some that run around the earth, as there be many gods, and he says, lords also are many. And then if you'll turn over to chapter 10, you see he goes on in the next verse to say there's really only one Lord and there's one God. And he's going to tell us because chapters 8, 9, and 10 are one section, you see, in 1 Corinthians. 8, 9, and 10 are just one section. So he's further developing what he set forth in chapter 8 over here in chapter 10, where he's coming back to this question of Christian liberty with regard to eating meat offered to idols. And he says in verse 16, well, let's go back up to verse 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Idolatry is worshipped of other gods. But do any other gods really exist as we understand the term God? No, they don't exist. You say, well, we just read over there where he said they do exist. Well, read the next verse, the one we didn't read. He said there is no God but one God. Amen. And there is no Lord but one. There are pseudo-gods and pseudo-lords that maybe go by the name of Cupid. But in essence, what they are are demons. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. In other words, the carnal mind will never catch what he's saying. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break. This is very interesting. We're going to come back to this later on. We just did this tonight. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, being many, are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel after the flesh, that is, Israel of the Old Testament, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? He says, rather I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice they sacrifice to demons. He said, there is a particular time to engage yourself in eating and drinking. And it's at the celebration of the death of Jesus Christ. But all of these other holidays have their own little candies, their own little goodies. Valentine's Day, all of the little hearts that come out around then, they all have their own little sacrificial meals, in other words, that go along with them. Christmas, it's a big ham, big roast out of the oven, pecan, pumpkin pie, fruitcake. They all have their own sacrificial meal that, guess what? You're offering to demons. You're offering these things to demons. When you sat down many years ago at your table with little candles and holly, fake holly, how be it, at the center of the table, Nobody has anything real today. It's always this fake stuff, fake snow all over the house. And you're a fake Christian there. When you sat down there many years ago and you just bowed your head and thanked God Almighty for getting you up that morning and giving you a good day and said in Christ's name we pray amen and then you delved into that meal. Oh, you were really participating well. We all were, dear friends, at a sacrificial meal for demons. Because Santa Claus doesn't exist except as a demon. St. Nicholas never existed except as a demon. Little elves at the North Pole don't exist. Little reindeer that fly through the sky don't exist That's right. except as demons. These, these figures that Israel was worshiping, they didn't exist except in the forms of demons. There was not a literal Jupiter or Zeus at the top of some mountain, not a literal one some big burly figure up there, but there was a demon somewhere in history who represented him and who still exists today, by the way. They never die. They never die. They're still out there. They'll just come under different guises today. Well, verse 20, this is how important it is. I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with demons. Participating in Valentine's Day is having fellowship with demons. Fellowship with Lupercus. <laughs> fellowship with Cupid, Venus, and Febra Juno. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. 
You can't do both. Can you be a Christian and a participator in these pagan occult holidays? He said, you can't do both. You can't come to your little Sunday church service and have communion and then go home and have Christmas that Eve. You can't do both of them. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons as well. Christmas is the time to drink on the bottle or on the glass or on the cup or just pour it in a brown bag if you're thirsty enough and drink it out of that. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. That's what your dining room table was. It was a table of demons. And who was around it? Pagans? Well, yes, but church-going pagans because we were never taught otherwise in our church. You see, you've never been taught. I was never taught anything. I never heard anything like what I'm telling you about these things, right from the Word of God, so that you see it in the light in which it's intended by God for you to see. When you're sitting there around the table, everyone thinks this is really a religious occasion. It's an occult occasion. And now I'll just rant and rave over these demon worshipers out there that go to the first church of Satan. That's all First Baptist is, dear friends. That's all it is. Just goes by a different name. We've said before, if the devil can't come right out and deceive you, what will he come as? An angel of light. That's right in the Word of God. He won't dare call it First Church of Satan. Nobody will come. He'll call it First Baptist, though. Many Baptists will come. Many Baptists will come to Christmas dinners. Many Baptists will come to Valentine's potluck. Yes, they will, too. And he says, if you're partaking with them, you cannot partake with the Lord. If you're having fellowship with them, you exclude yourself from the kingdom. Serious consequences in this business about the holidays. We're not playing games. I hate the holidays because it's worship of Satan. And that's exactly what you should think. Well, let's go on to another one. <clears throat> that's Valentine. We could probably spend a whole night on all of these, but I want to finish up by going through the rest of these holidays tonight. Let's come to another one. Let's come to Halloween. Mm -hmm. Halloween. You could do a lot of in-depth study of these things. We did a lot of it with Christmas and Easter because they're so important. But I think that if we can convince you about Christmas and Easter, then the rest of these are no problem. Amen. If you can give those two up, these are nothing but extra baggage. If you can get, get anyone yourself convinced about Christmas and Easter, then you hardly have to mention Valentine's Day. <laughs> Because someone might give up Valentine's Day, I'm saying, but keep Christmas. But if you can get them to give up Christmas, they'll give up anything. Then that's the number one holiday. Many charismatics have given up Halloween today, but they haven't given up Valentine's Day. They haven't given up Christmas or Easter today. Oh, no, they won't go out and participate in the occult on Halloween like they've done in the past. Some of them have gotten their eyes open to that. What I'm saying is if you would start with Christmas and get them worked over in a corner on Christmas, then they'll give up anything after that because that's the chief holiday. <laughs> you don't get anything but some frights and scares on Halloween and a lot of junk food as well. But on Christmas, all of these expensive items you get, so no one wants to give that time up. It formerly was known as the Eve of All Hallows. Hallows was the old English term for saints. Just another word for saints, hallows because it was the ninth that preceded All Saints Day on November the 1st. And it too was steeped in paganism. We've shown you in the studies in creation that November has been recognized throughout the world and its history as the month of the dead. And so in preparation for this dreadful month of the dead, where cultures recognize that something dreadful happened to their ancestors many hundreds and thousands of years ago. I didn't say hundreds of thousands, but hundreds and thousands, lest someone think we believe the earth was four billion years old or something. But as we've set forth in the creation, in the creation studies, many cultures, if not all, that have records, that have a memory that exists today mm -hmm. of what has happened in the past, they have a particular dread and fear of the month of November. And so what do you do? Well, the night before the month begins, you know when Halloween is. 
then you appease the demons, you appease the gods by having a celebration in the honor of the dead and in the honor of these gods, goddesses, demons as well. In other words, you don't want to die yourself during the month of November. In some cultures, it's a dreadful thought to perish during that month because that is supposed to be the month of demonism. And so you want to get ready for that by appeasing the gods the night before it all starts. Now, in the traditions of the Celts and the Anglo-Saxons, it represented the beginning of the new year. We have a new year January 1st. They had a new year November the 1st. So this All Hallows' Eve, or the Eve of All Hallows, marked the beginning for the Celts and the Anglo-Saxons of their new year. And they marked it by building huge bonfires on hilltops throughout the country to frighten away evil spirits. You didn't want the evil spirits to come and take your soul. And so it's just true that throughout all of Europe, demons and Ghosts and black cats, magic, witchcraft, sorcery, voodoo is all associated with this day. You see, it's known by knowledgeable people today that on Satan's calendar, this is the most important day. Because I mean in the out and out Satan worshiping groups, this is a tremendous day, a tremendous night. Because it is recognized. Again, we're talking about church members as well. It's time to put on your fake mask and lie to people, telling them you're someone that you're not. It's time to wear these little ghost and goblin costumes that the children in the churches are encouraged to participate in. I was raised a life in the church, and I was raised by the standards of Halloween at the same time. I guess you can see that all Hallow's Eve, it's just, Halloween is just a contraction of the phrase. Hallow it's hallows eve sooner or later the word was just contracted the phrase was contracted to have this one word halloween and by the way forget for a moment that it does have to do with demon worship specifically i'm talking about above all the others everyone recognizes this has to do with ghosts goblins black cats witches demons sorcerers sorceresses and the likes forget that for a moment since it was all Hallow's Eve, it was also in the church incorporated as supposedly a festival, a feast, in commemoration of the dead saints. So we're saying this in addition to demon worship. Now you say, well, what does that mean? Well, my question, my thoughts always are, who are these dead saints? I bet a lot of them were adulterers, fornicators, liars, murderers, dead saints. What's, what's, your de what's the, the Catholic Church's definition of a saint? Sometimes they're pretty low-down people. And what are you celebrating? You're celebrating their life and their death, their life that they lived and their martyr death or whatever type of death that they had at the end of their life. They terminated their life. You're doing this on All Hallows' Eve. That's just kind of a side thought to remember that people evidently don't even think of. They do get caught up in the demonic ideas and don't realize we're worshiping a lot of dead saints, dead Catholic saints, who, if they were anything, according to the definitions of what a saint is in the Bible, they weren't Christians. They weren't believers. You're worshiping unbelievers. The dead and buried and gone to purgatory or hell, one or the other, they're really one and the same. You're worshiping the souls of these men and women who have died in the past. Well, let's bring it back to its demonic element because that's where it is most important and that's where it's most dangerous today. What are charismatics doing? They're having a hallelujah night on this night to do what? To scare away the demons. That's why, why they shout a lot, to scare away the demons. And they never think you're doing the same thing. That's what Halloween is about. You see, the reason that we've got this initiated is to get rid of evil spirits. What it ends up doing, because you're taking so much of your time about them, it ends up a worship of the evil spirits. And a lot of people go overboard and really get into this worship of Satan around this time of the year. 
but it started off as something that was supposed to get rid of the demons, keep them away from you in your life. And so what have charismatics done? The exact same thing. They think, well, Halloween, what that is, is a worship of Satan. So what we'll do, we'll just praise God to keep all those evil spirits away. That's exactly what Halloween's all about. They don't even know that they're doing what they don't think that they're doing by worshiping the devil on that day of the year. Why did you pick that day of the year, that night of the year, I should say, to have your hallelujah night? It's because you're scared of demons and the devil. You're trying to keep them away from you. Well, we said about Christmas that it was the, the Dutch immigrants into New York that brought their conceptions about St. Nicholas into this country. We owe to the Irish immigrants to the United States in the end of the 1800s the modern-day customs of mischief-making, which is another further development of the eve of all hallows. You know, it sounds like we're talking about some, uh, some fictional time in history or something, but all these things are really true. It's like something that would come right out of Hollywood, the eve of all hallows. But it came right out of the church, though. A worship of Satan and demons to keep them away from you. Well, I said to the Irish immigrants, we owe the introduction into this country in the late 1800s of the present-day mischief making ideas and games. It later evolved into the door-to-door trick-or-treat in the early part of this century, and particularly as we get up into the 1940s that children are involved in today. Trick-or-treat, you know what the phrase means? You probably do now, but as a child, none of us knew what that phrase meant. You knew it was just the thing you were supposed to say whenever you knocked on a door. You knocked on a door and you said, trick or treat. You probably said it so fast as a child you thought it was one word. You didn't know that you were offering that person an alternative. You can have a trick or a treat. That is, you give me a treat and I won't give you a trick. In other words, it was an offering of one or the other. And you see, this is what a lot of people don't recognize. This is what is get, it's getting back to this today. We more or less went through a cycle. Whenever it was introduced by the Irish immigrants into this country, Halloween was a time for mischief-making. They didn't roll people's yards with toilet tissue back then. They did a lot more dangerous and destructive things. And then as the children really began to pick it up and participate in this door-to-door festival of Satan, then they toned down some of these more obvious and some of these more rude and crude and destructive mischief-making ideas and processes to just using the little catchphrase, trick-or-treat. But what that really meant, and we're seeing a full-scale swing back to what it used to be like that I'll explain here in a moment, by whenever you come to the door, you ask them for a treat. If they don't give you a treat, then what you guarantee them is I'll pull some trick on you. But back when, let's say back in the 60s, back in the 50s, or whenever, whenever you were doing it, did you ever pull a trick on someone? Probably not. Uh, not every time someone didn't give you a treat because you didn't even know that's what you were saying whenever you said trick or treat. Now, what I meant a moment ago by saying it's coming full swing today is it's really a dangerous thing to participate in Halloween today. I remember just about the time I was growing past that, back in, I guess, the 60s, just about the time I was growing past that was a time that you started getting poison razor blades, pins and needles, all types of things. You know, the revolts of the 60s, the late 60s and early 70s, you started getting this in all of your candy, in all of your goodies. And now they knock on the door like I read in a recent article, a recent report, where one individual knocked on the door and the woman answered the door and wanted to offer him some candy. He said, we don't want your candy. We want your money. That's what we want. Now, what that has become is just an open door policy for thieves. You no longer have to wait till someone's gone and burglarize their home. Guess what? They'll open your, their door for you on Halloween night. It's an invitation to theft, to robbery, to rape, to murder. That's exactly what's taking place on that night. Because before that and after that, in other words, you, you've got to catch them on that night while all everything's barred up, the doors are locked. 
And you know what? It's just surprising. You go buy a lot of houses like we did just a while back, and there's a whole lot of houses. There's not a light on in the house. Mm -hmm. Why? It's a time to leave your house. Mm -hmm. You don't want these wild hoodlums. We're talking about six years old wild hoodlums right. beating on your door. Right. Because they don't want any candy. Uh, they stole enough from I don't know who last week to buy a whole house if they wanted to. They don't want any of this junky food anymore. These little souls carry pistols and knives with them whenever they knock on. You think about this, the trends in American society, where in earlier days that was just a fun time. All of the old people were at home. They loved to see the little kids come around and knock on the door and stick little goodies in their little hollowed-out pumpkins, plastic pumpkins that they had and so forth. It's not so true anymore. The devil, in other words, is taking his toll on people and on society. Now you open the door, you're in trouble. And I remember growing past that just about that time where it's dangerous. You see mothers and fathers out walking with their children now. We never had our parents walk with us. We walked all around the neighborhood. But you can't do that anymore. Some man who's in child pornography will pick up as many children as his bus will hold whenever he drives down the street this time of the year. That's exactly what goes on now. 